Good morning. Today is Sunday, July 26th. We gather today to celebrate the resurrection and worship God. I'm glad that you've joined us today. I have a few announcements before we begin. Uh, you should have received a copy of the August newsletter, either via uh, the U.S. mail or email. If you have not received that by tomorrow's mail, uh, please let me know and we'll make sure that you're on the list. Uh, in that newsletter is lots of information about our uh, in-person worship service that we'll be having next Sunday, August 2nd, in our Grove. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me this week uh, and hopefully I can answer them. Uh, even though we won't have the opportunity to socialize much next Sunday, I do look forward to seeing a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while, or at least the top, the top half of those phases. I have also resumed making home communion visits. Um, if you would like to schedule such a visit, please let me know. Uh, I'm also now able to make hospital visits in certain circumstances. So uh, if you or a loved one uh, is going into the hospital, please let me know. And if I am able to make that visit, I will. Let us begin our worship with the prelude. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom, that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, um, Jesus told a lot of little stories once, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you tell some of those stories. And they were all about the kingdom of God. Now, what's a kingdom? Do you know what a kingdom is? Like a castle. A, 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 a castle? Okay. Like a place that a king a place that it can't control. Yeah, a kingdom is it's like a country, but who's in charge of that country? Who's in charge of a kingdom? It's an the easy king question. And the king and queen, that's right. Well, when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, it's not really a place. It's not really like, you know, you know, God is stand somewhere that, that, that God is in charge of. But it's it's when God is in charge of our lives. That's what the kingdom of God means. So when, when, when God's the one in charge. So these are the things that Jesus said the kingdom of God is like. He said the kingdom of God is like the things I have in this bag. So I got five things in this bag. We're going to pull them out one by one and we'll tell you what Jesus said. You want to go first? All right. The kingdom of God is like, what's that? Um, a net. It's a net. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like what happens when fishermen throw a net into a lake and it gets Filled up with fish. This can only fit like 10 small fish. Well, the kingdom of God is like a bigger net than that, I guess. And, and they throw out the bad fish and bring all the good fish in. Your turn. Pick some out of the bag. Ooh, what's that? What do you think that is? I don't know. A box? It's a box. What would you call that box? Chest. A chest? You could also call it a treasure box. There could be treasures in there. Yeah, right now there's nothing in there. Or a treasure chest. You could call it a treasure chest. Yeah. Well, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like treasure. And it's like this. The kingdom of God is like when somebody was walking through a field and found a buried treasure there. With using the net, they scooped it out. Maybe. And what that person did was they hid the treasure again, and they went and sold everything they had and bought that field. So the treasure could be theirs. Pick another one. What's that? Yeast. Yeast. Do you know what no, yeast, yeast is? The amount of yeast ever. No. You only need a little bit of yeast. You could use, you'd be amazed what, what you could do with this much yeast. Yeast are these little, little tiny, tiny things. You know what they're good for? No. If you try to make bread and don't use yeast, you know what happens? The bread is what, you know? Flat. Flat. It's flat bread. Is it still edible? Sure. It what just it tastes very different. Like It'll taste like flat bread. It's different. But if you add yeast in when you're baking bread, what happens? It rises. It, that's so exactly high right. The bread rises. That's why bread gets so fluffy and, and big sometimes. So Jesus said the kingdom of God is like when a woman mixed in just a little yeast with three measures of flour and it made the whole batch of dough rise. All right, there's two more in here. You get to pick the, the last one because then, then nobody has to pick the final ones. And you pick which one of these you want for next. Oh, it's supposed to pick. It doesn't matter. That's fine. Have to win. That's fine, too. What's that? Can you read that word there? Mustard. Mustard, that's right. Does this look like the mustard you put on your... On, well, you don't use mustard, but the mustard that, that, that your mother and I use sometimes? This is, this is ground mustard, and you know what they make this from? Wow. Mustard seeds. They grind up mustard seeds. And you know what? Mustard seeds aren't that much bigger than those little grains. Mustard seeds are so tiny. Are, are mustard seeds, do mustard seeds actually make real mustard? They make mustard plants. And from the mustard plants, they get, bottles of mustard. they get this, and then use this to make bottles of mustard. 
So Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a farmer plants a mustard seed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but it grows larger and larger than any other bush. In fact, it becomes a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. Something this tiny, birds come and make nests in its branches. And the last one. Who wants to pull up the last one? You got it? All right. All right, Zoe, put it back after you pull it out. Now put it back. Now you pull it. But it's pretty, and I want it. What is this? A necklace. A necklace. And what are these things on the necklace? Pearls. Pearls. I don't know if these are real pearls or not. They're probably not. But they look like pearls. And Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like what happens when a shop owner is looking for pearls to buy. Well, when he finds a very, very valuable one, like the best pearl he's ever found, you know what he does? He sells everything he had to buy that one pearl. So the kingdom of God sounds like something pretty important, right? So there's something that can do big things and something that, can, uh, that people really, really want to get. So thank you for your help today. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for fighting over this necklace. And thank you for handing it to me, Ben. <laughs> ben, you said I could have it. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. Help us to always follow you there. Help us to always follow you there. Amen. 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 The first reading is from Kings. Because Solomon did not ask for a long life, riches, or the defeat of his enemies, God gave him what he asked for, wisdom to govern the people well. At Gideon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown the great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, in uprightness of the heart towards you. And you have kept him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today and now O Lord my God you have made your servant king in place of my father David although I am only a little child I do not know how to go out or come in and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For you, for who can govern this your people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I do according to your word. Indeed, I give you wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 119. Your decrees are wonderful. Therefore, I obey them with all my heart. When your word is open to give light, it gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as you always do to those who love your name. Order my footsteps in your word. Let no inequity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me, and I will keep your commandments. Let your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your teaching. 
The second reading is from Romans. These words celebrate the death of God's action for us. Through Christ's death for us and the activity of the Spirit praying for us, we are fused to God's love poured out in Jesus Christ. Nothing, not even death itself, is able to separate us from such an incredible divine love. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sights too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God, in order that the Son might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom God predestined, God also called. And those whom God called, God also justified. And those whom God justified, God also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? The very Son of God was not withheld, but was given up for all of us. Will God not along with his Son also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? If it is Jesus Christ who died, yes, who was raised, who is in the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written. For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in a field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of the household treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. I fell in love with today's second reading a long time ago. 
The passage that begins, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The passage that ends, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. It was my first semester in college, a particularly rough time in my life. My depression was flaring. I had attempted suicide. But finally, finally I was getting help, staying at a psychiatric hospital for 11 days. While there, I discovered Romans chapter 8. And I'll come back in a few minutes to why this passage helped me during that time. First, I want to tell you about a conversation I had after I returned to college from the hospital. I was talking with my friend Lisa about everything that had happened, how I'd been feeling, what the hospital was like. Now Lisa was dating my roommate Eric at the time, and she said to me, did you know that Eric was praying for you the whole time? Now I knew that Eric was Christian, Episcopalian to be precise, but he and I never really talked about spiritual stuff. So I was surprised when Lisa told me that. But it meant so much to me to know that Eric was praying for me. That he cared about me so much that he brought up my name as he spoke to God. There's something very special about knowing that someone is praying for you. When we started praying each week for each family and Prince of Peace a few years ago, several people told me that it meant so much to them to know that they were being prayed for by the whole congregation. And a very, very old pastor recently told me that back when he was in his first parish, a homebound woman he visited regularly once told him, Pastor, I pray for you every day. It meant so much to him to know that someone was praying for him. How many people are praying for you, I wonder? I don't know. But here's what I do know. Thanks to today's second reading, I know that you are prayed for. Listen. Who is to condemn us? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Christ Jesus, the crucified and risen one, intercedes for us, which is the churchy way of saying, Jesus prays for us. Jesus is praying for us. The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our great high priest before God, praying for us. And in John's Gospel, Jesus makes time the night before he was killed to devote all of chapter 17 to a long prayer for us. Jesus is praying for you right now. Feel that. Jesus, who knows you inside and out, is praying for you. And wait, there's more. Listen again to our second reading. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. That's right, the Holy Spirit is praying for us. And listen for when the Spirit does that, in our weakness, in those times when we don't know how to pray. And let's be honest, that happens a lot. There are times we don't know how to put our feelings into words. There are times we don't even know what to pray for. And there are times we just completely forget about prayer. In those times, in all of those times, the Holy Spirit uses our sighs, our groans, our very breath to pray for us. When we forget how to pray, the Holy Spirit takes over, praying for what we truly need, what we truly crave, what we truly are. So, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are praying for you right now. Two-thirds of the Holy Trinity, which is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, two-thirds of the Holy Trinity are praying for you. And the other third? You know what God the Father is doing while the Son and the Spirit pray? The Father is listening to those prayers. 
That's how much God loves you. God loves you so much that two-thirds of God is praying for you to the other third. Now, don't tell any of my seminary professors that I phrased it that way. I'm not 100% sure that that's a theologically accurate description of how the Holy Trinity works. But this much is true. God loves you so much that God is praying for you. And God loves you so much that God is listening to those prayers. Somehow or another, that much is true. God loves you so much that nothing will stop God's love from reaching you. Thanks to Christ, nothing can separate us from God's love. Not hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or sword. As Paul wrote in today's second reading. Not death. Not life. Not angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. None of it can separate us from God's love. And for me, 27 years ago in that psychiatric hospital, one week after that suicide attempt, this passage meant this. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Not even my own twisted thoughts. Not even my own agonized feelings. Not even my own self-destructive self. Not even my own doubt. Nothing can separate us from God. Nothing. At Bible study on Thursday, we talked about things that threaten to separate us from God's love today. And we paraphrased Paul's words this way. I am convinced that neither COVID-19, nor loneliness, nor heartbreak, nor frustration, nor anger, nor racism, nor partisanship, nor uncertainty, nor disappointment will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. These things are real. They're not pretend, they're real problems, but they can't stand in the face of God. God comes to us despite all that, even through all that. And what would you add to that list? What is threatening to separate God from you in your life? It won't. It can't. No matter what it is, no matter what it is, anything at all in all creation, it will never, ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Spirit comes to us in our weakness, and nothing can separate us from God. Alleluia. Amen.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident in your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed in the common things of our lives, a mustard seed, a woman baking bread, a fishing net. Help your church in this place, Prince of Peace, witness to the surprising yet common ways you encounter us in our daily lives. Flowers blooming, a bird in flight, hands folded in prayer. Lord in mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, when your word is open, it gives light and understanding. We ask you increase our understanding and awe of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers as they strive for cures. May we all treasure your earth and all in it. Let us gratefully strive to be the healing caretakers of this home that you have so lovingly given us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, as the birds of the air flock to nest in branches of trees, gather together the nations of this world into the welcoming coolness of the shade of your reign. Direct the leaders of all nations to work towards building trust and may they walk in your way towards peace. Teach them to be examples, ridding the world of hatred, division, and strife. Let them know your will and follow it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit, for we are weak and sometimes struggle to do your will. We thank you for giving us the words we need, for we do not know how to pray. Let us remember, although we feel we are not worthy, you use ordinary people to accomplish your will. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice to the oppressed, and healing to the sick. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of all, you show steadfast love that, you, that can never be taken away from us, no matter what. You are waiting to give us all we need if we but ask you. Help this congregation to not only ask for what we need, but to consider the needs of those not only in our community, but of the entire world too. Refresh our faith with dreams of being your people, loving and caring for one another. We ask you to bring joy to those having birthdays this week. Charmaine Collins, Butch Stana, Dale Setzer, Jacqueline Horn, Emily Flight, William Wasmer, Taylor Baker. We wish them a blessing day full of happiness and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Dear Father, in our lives we are never lost. Strengthen our faith by the inspiring witness of your faithful people Whose, stores we read, whose stories we read in your Bible. Those who have come and gone before us, help us to follow their example and one day gather us together with them in the heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In the certain hope that nothing can ever separate us from your unconditional love and protection, we offer these prayers to you now, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
We've heard stories of people making and sharing meals, handing out free homemade masks, and donating their time. But did you know there is someone who thanked essential workers with balloons? Eddie Lynn is a 20-year-old artist from Edison, New Jersey. He was diagnosed with autism at birth. He would usually spend his spring and early summers making balloons for weddings, birthday parties, and other celebrations. He also works at part-time at the local library and special needs school. But this year was different. Since weddings and parties were very few and libraries and schools were closed, Eddie decided to use his talents to bring smiles to those working on the front lines during the pandemics. Eddie made balloon creations and his parents posted pictures on Facebook and Instagram. He goes by the name Awesome Balloon Creator. Some of the creations Eddie made were a balloon shopping cart for a friend who worked in a supermarket and a mail carrier in his truck. He posted that we shouldn't forget to thank these workers for all they do for us. Eddie became interested in balloon art when he was 10 years old and taught himself from it videos on YouTube. His family created a small business where he now creates his balloons for requests and special occasions with their help. His mother says his talent has taught him how to interact with people. People are inspired by his stories and tell and write to tell Eddie about how they, they too are impacted by autism. Eddie's mom says that balloons are usually for happy occasions. If the pandemic has shown her anything, it's that no matter how hard this is, we should all enjoy and then celebrate life. Eddie says his favorite balloon art is the Hulk. Visit Eddie on Facebook and Instagram to see more pictures and videos of his creations. Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. <laughs>